hello everyone who is joining us for tonight's webinar. I'm going to do that strange bit where I talk for a few minutes while people come in and onto the Zoom. Um, but it's really exciting to have you all joining us tonight for this chat. Um, I'm really pleased actually that you're all joining us because I know that uh, it is uh, a big ask to um, have people join us on Zoom at the moment now that it's a bit easier to get out and about and people are um, thankfully enjoying um, going out and having meetings in person and doing fewer Zooms. Um, so I do really appreciate you all taking the time tonight um, for this discussion. Uh, it is 6.03 so I will kick us off. Um, for those of you who I haven't met or had the chance to talk to before, I'm Kate Waits, I'm the Federal Member for Jagger Jagger. Uh, I'm here in Canberra with Richard Miles and I'm going to begin by acknowledging that Richard and I are on the lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I know most of you will be on Wurundjeri country in Melbourne. Um, but I'm really pleased that Richard can join me tonight for this discussion. Uh, this is, a, I think, about the third of these discussions that I've had recently with Shadow Ministers to really talk about what does our country look like now that we're coming through the pandemic and what is it that Labor sees uh, as what we need to do next and, and what's the vision and obviously Richard holds a number of important portfolios. He is our Deputy Leader. He is also the Shadow Minister for National Reconstruction, for Employment, for Skills and for Small Businesses. So really crucial areas I think particularly as we do do that part now in Victoria and Richard and I are obviously both Victorians about what it looks like coming out and I know in the conversations I've been having in the electorate there is both a feeling of relief from people, a bit of tiredness, we are all a bit tired, but also that real desire to know, does our future look better? What are the secure jobs that are gonna be there for us? What are the industry opportunities that are gonna drive our economic recovery? So uh, it's really great that Richard is here to talk to us about all of that. And on that note, Richard, I'll hand over to you. Actually, sorry, I should do the other admin. Before I hand over to Richard, um, I'll, we'll take questions once Richard has finished. Please put your questions in the Q&A box and I'll put them to Richard. Um, use the chat box for chat if you want to chat amongst yourself or make comments, but uh, questions in the Q&A box so that we can make sure we get to them. Thanks. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Kate. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Let me also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of land on which, as, as Kate has said, that she and I join you from, uh, the Ngunnawal and Ambri peoples, um, you know, around Canberra and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, let me also acknowledge Kate, who um, in coming to uh, Canberra has done a, a fantastic, well, it certainly has made her presence felt, um, is really one of the up and coming stars in our show. I, I kind of, I've got to say, when I think about, um, the motivation to win an election, and there are many, uh, but part of it is, is seeing people like Kate uh, play a part in the running of our country and, and, and being given that opportunity because uh, she's already making a huge difference as uh, the member for Jagger Jagger. She'll make a, a much bigger difference as a, a member of uh, an Albanese Labor government. So um, great to be here with you, Kate, um, and really great to talk to all of you. Um, I guess at this moment in uh, the the pandemic and, and where we are, perhaps the um, if we're taking a step back and, and just trying to think about perspective here, um, what I, I think that sort of grabbed my attention in the last couple of months is uh, what seven weeks ago now we commemorated the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks on the United States, and we saw a lot of that vision as dramatic as it was appearing on our TV screens. And um, it really reminded me that through most of the period since 2001, I really figured that that would be the most um, dramatic event that I would live through in my lifetime, that we'd all live through. But really, the last um, 18 months with the pandemic has eclipsed that. The pandemic is unquestionably the most significant global event since the end of the, well, since the Second World War. I mean, it's completely reshaped all of our lives, even doing an event such as this in this way. Um, you know, I think, as, as Kate said, we're all feeling pretty tired um, after, well, 15 months of extended lockdowns one way or another. Uh, Victorians have done an incredible job, really, managing our way through. Um, and 
you know, I think government has let us down at, at, at a national level in lots of ways, actually, in terms of providing national leadership around um, our response to the, the pandemic, certainly in terms of having a timely rollout of the vaccine. But we will come out of this with a relatively low mortality rate compared to other parts of the world. And we are now in a, part, in a, in a situation where we're going to have very high vaccination rates and that does bode well for our future. That's the, that is absolutely the achievement of Australians and Victorians. Um, and it, it, it's very much the, achieve, the achievement of people on the street. Um, it does though, as, I guess at this moment, as we're kind of hopefully looking to a world beyond COVID, make us start thinking about or invite us to start thinking about the questions that Kate asked. Do we, what, what do we look like um, when this is done? Like if, 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 whenever we feel like we can say this is over, are we just back to where we were at the end of um, 2019? Or um, do we go to somewhere better? What, 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 what does this moment mean if it is of that gravity? Um, presumably it is not just a sort of blip on the graph. And um, if you think about the Second World War, life after it was completely different to life before it. Uh, and I, I think this is an event which offers, um, on a, in, a, in a bright way, the country a huge opportunity. I think it's actually the most significant moment to reimagine Australia since the end of the Second World War. And in a way, I think the challenge for the nation is whether or not we're going to pick up that uh, opportunity of reimagining the country. COVID has, I feel, been something of a report card on our uh, society and our economy. And much of it's been great. You know, like the sense of community that, that we feel, the way in which neighbours were looking after each other, the way in which we celebrate people who I'm not sure we thought about before, those who work in aged care, those who work in health, those who work in supermarkets, actually, you know, during those moments early on where people were pretty scared to go out and where there was a whole, you know, frankly, a lot of hysteria going on in supermarkets. Um, you know, the, the wearing different uniforms, but very much, I think, heroes within our society. That's all been great. Um, but there are other aspects to our economy which COVID has revealed where there are issues and, uh, and, and as the question is, are we going to deal with them? It is really clear we don't make things in Australia in anything like the way we used to. You know, COVID has made that clear. Um, we, we are a much simpler economy now um, than we were 10, 20, 30 years ago. That, that, that sounds counterintuitive, um, but it's true and it's not a good thing. Um, the, the Harvard Index of Economic Complexity is, is a measure well, of economic complexity. It, it, it's, it, it is a spectrum which has at one end of it um, the most basic subsistence economy that you might expect to see in the developing world. And at the other end, you've got the most high-tech manufacturing economy, most sophisticated services economy, which turns out to be Japan. Uh, I think Korea is rated three, Singapore at five, China's top 20, Malaysia's top 30. Gives you a, a sense of, of what the index is. In, in a way, it's kind of an, an index of modernity. Um, we are falling down that index at an alarming rate. Now, I think where lies modernity lies prosperity. And actually, from a labour point of view, lies the best distribution of income. But the gap between where we are and the cutting edge of modernity is a gap which is growing. Australia right now ranks 86th on that index. Uh, we are sandwiched between Burkina Faso and Uganda. That, that's actually true. Um, it is because of the extent to which we have become an economy which is very reliant on our primary industry. And primary industry is great. There is no criticism um, in that. But a lot of the complexity that was in our economy um, isn't there now. Uh, the most obvious example is we don't make cars anymore. It was the most high-tech complex manufacturing which was done in this country. We're not doing it anymore. We've seen a real loss of um, high-tech industry uh, during the last eight years and COVID um, has really borne that out. And to me, um, it kind of, I think, uh, frames in a way that, that the challenge that we have as a nation and that is that we, we really need to um, climb the technological ladder. Um, we need to, you know, close that gap between us and the leading edge of modernity. And if you kind of um, drill into that a little bit more, we do science and tech uh, 
well. Uh, I mean, we, we, we punch at about our weight in the sense that the, the raw science that's generated in Australia is what you would expect on the various indices of an economy of our size. But what we don't do well is commercialise that. Indeed, our ability to commercialise science is probably as bad as any country within the OECD. Um, and so if I was to sort of say, what do I think is the most significant microeconomic reform uh, facing the country today, it's actually turning science into jobs. Um, that's what fundamentally we must do. Um, and to me, that is a, a coming out of COVID and thinking about how we might course correct and how we might try and build an economy for the future. It is in tackling that issue um, that we need to act. And I think, you know, the, the, it, it's to sort of think about what's at stake here. Um, if you accept the proposition that where lies modernity lies prosperity, um, there is, um, and you know, and as I speak to science leaders of science and industry around the country, you know, there is a genuine fear about what the country looks like in the middle of this century. Um, if, if we keep falling down that ground, or, or that that index really, is, if you want an alarm bell about what prosperity looks like or the lack of it in the middle of this century for our kids and our grandkids, people that we will know and love, it is that. And that's what we need to change. And, and changing that, um, I think, then becomes something of, of playing to our strengths, meaning what is it that we think we could reasonably expect to be leading the world in, um, in, in, in technological terms, or if not leading the world being in the, in, in the top two or three. Um, we, we announced the National Reconstruction Fund earlier in the year, and we see this as a, a very significant $15 billion fund, which would be aimed at, in a sense, trying to meet this challenge, looking at what our strengths are, playing to them, and working out ways in which we can really turbocharge those parts of the economy such that we can commercialise that science, build that technology and help lead the country um, down the path of, of, of kind of climbing back up the technological ladder. The next obvious question is, what are those strengths? Well, you know, I, I actually think primary industry takes us there a little bit. We are very high tech farmers. Um, that's great and we should keep being that, but we should be the leaders of the world in agricultural science. Um, and we should be looking at thinking about ways in which we can develop that and the jobs that come from it. Um, in truth, mining, we, we're very high tech miners. We can do the same there. Um, but as I go and speak to uh, scientists about you know, what they think is, is the sort of best opportunity for us to really lead the world in science and tech, um, you, you invariably get you know, this one area which come, kind of comes out top consistently and it's renewable energy renewable energy you know it's renewable energy for this reason we 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 are endowed as a nation with incredible renewable energy um, resources and it's worth just explaining that because sometimes that rolls off the tongue a bit easily we have the longest lateral coastline uh, to the roaring 40s which is the most consistent wind source on the planet um, because it's the latitude where there is the least um, land mass uh, at, at that latitude. That's why the Roaring Forties exist. Um, we have trade winds to our north. We have a desert um, which is as close to the equator as the Sahara, which means that along with the Sahara, we have the highest quality of solar radiation, meaning the, the, the solar radiation, which is most efficiently turned into electricity. And we're in a much better position to exploit our resource than the countries of the Sahara. And we've got all of that here. That, that's actually a, a, a right there is a, a reason why we should be leading the world in renewable energy take up. But we should be leading the world in renewable energy science and we should be leading the world in renewable energy export. And actually the resources sector is a critical part of that because renewable energy export is all about hydrogen, um, essentially um, electro, uh, putting an electric shock through water, turning it into oxygen and hydrogen bottling the hydrogen, sending it overseas, and in the process of um, putting it back into water, you release energy. So that, that hydrogen, the hydrogen industry is the means by which we export renewable energy. Um, that's, we should be the leaders in that. And increasingly, I think what we're gonna find is that as we tackle the question, which has been debated a lot in the last couple of weeks of um, decarbonizing 
our economy as part of the process of playing our part in you know, decarbonising glo the global economy. That really is the great scientific challenge of uh, the world. And seeking to be modern is going to, I think, increasingly be defined by the extent to which we are playing our part in that and taking our country down the path of that challenge. So that's critically important as well. Final point, and I'm kind of rambling on a bit here, but um, what, what, what has also become really clear, I think, during COVID um, is a question around skills. Uh, I remember actually speaking to a scientist about, you know, why, did, why is it that we, you know, what, what, what's wrong with us that we don't, we're not so good at commercialising science? And the very first reaction, which I did not expect, was we don't have the skills density here to do it. I've got the skills density to do it. Um, it, it. We are not training people in anything like the way that we need to be. And, and this is not because of COVID, but COVID has made it really clear with the international border being closed um, and without the presence of uh, people in Australia on temporary work visas, and let me be really clear up front, I'm a total supporter of um, an open Australia, an open border and, and a strong uh, immigration program. I think that's that's very much central to who we are as a nation, something we also do very well in. And I say that as a former shadow minister for immigration, I, I think it's really important for our coming future. So it's not making a comment about that as such, but what it is to say is that the experience of having had the international border closed for a couple of years has made it really clear that we are not training enough of our own people um, to do the jobs out there. And that in part is about making sure that we've got more people wearing white lab coats with PhDs, but it's actually much more about making sure that we've got people with trade skills um, in a whole range of areas, including areas such as the care economy. We've got to make sure our tape sector is not the kind of um, poorer cousin of our educational system. Uh, and we've got to make sure that our schools, as much uh, uh, in, in the excellent job they do in preparing people for university, are also preparing those people who want to pursue a career through getting a trade to go to TAFE as well, and that that is seen as just as valid an option. So, you know, I think when we're talking about climbing the technological ladder, um, there's, there is a lot in the commercialisation of science space, there's a lot in the innovation space, but invariably you end up talking about the need for us to be deepening our skills base in the country. And that's across the whole sort of spectrum of, of, of well, across the entire educational spectrum where we need to do that. All of that is what I hope is um, probably in a slightly more retail way than I've done it tonight, but all of that I hope is kind of what we're talking about during the next election campaign. I mean, that would be an exciting election if, if, if we're talking about these sorts of issues. What I'm absolutely sure about is that in the next term of government, um, whether we, um, well, it will, it will answer the question as to whether Australia takes the opportunity to reimagine ourselves or whether we don't. And in that, I think it's gonna be the most significant term of government in really defining kind of what kind of a country we look like with what kind of prosperity in the middle of this century. I think this is a profoundly important moment. It is akin to those post-war years. Um, where really so much of our modern society was constructed. Um, and, you know, it's for that reason that we are very energised as well as getting Kate into a position where she's serving in a government. We're very energised to uh, seeing Labor win because um, I know this is what we will be about if we end up uh, being fortunate enough to win the next election. I'm, I'm also really clear in my mind that the mob who are currently running the joint uh, haven't got a clue about any of this and they are just going to sit there and miss that opportunity. So, Kate, I might leave my um, comments there. I'm really happy to answer questions. Thank you, Richard. And we've got a lot of questions um, coming in and I was just reflecting while you're talking about how that really does reflect the breadth of what I'm hearing from the electorate, you know, from our manufacturing base in Heidelberg West, where I've met with manufacturers there who talked about the loss of skills that happened when the car industry left Australia and the impact that's had sort of on their sector more broadly, um, the discussions I'm having with young people now about what jobs look like and with their parents as well, you know, parents mm -hmm. are really concerned about what do jobs look like in the future. Um, and of course, for us in Jagger Jagger as well, we do have La Trobe University, we've got Melbourne Polytechnic, and they're looking at how do they become part of, um, you know, skilling people up and making that transition you're talking about from research into 
um, into the, the jobs and, and the industry. So it's absolutely a live discussion. Um, I will not talk anymore. I will go to the many, many questions we have coming in. Um, first, Richard from Don, who is concerned about the advent of Uber type jobs, uh, that these are jobs that exploit people, they're non-union, they're low paid, they're risky and they're unsafe. Uh, and that um, there is actually a short supply of people who are working these jobs now that overseas students haven't been able to be in Australia in the same way. What would a Labor government do to protect people in these types of jobs? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. And uh, uh, my background is in the union movement, as it turns out, in uh, the, I was in the Transport Workers Union and then at the ACTU. And um, the car, well, Uber didn't exist, obviously, then, but the, uh, not just Uber, but things like uh, Deliveroo, Airtasker, the, the whole gig economy was, well, it was, un, it was literally unimaginable when I was uh, around. Um, and we did, you know, have seen in Australia, and it's uh, not not completely unique to Australia, but it does go. It, it, it's a it, it's a sort of element element that characterises our labour market that we have um, a, a, a quite a high degree of people who are on what would be described as atypical employment, meaning um, non full time permanent. So. Um, and it's not, this is not to say that all those forms of employment are per se bad by any means. A whole lot of people want to be on those forms of employment, but it is just to say that we've got a lot of people on them. So um, permanent, part-time, casual, um, th there's a sort of almost unique situation in Australia where we have a, people who are permanent casuals, which kind of makes no sense, but that we've actually, there's a lot of people who describe themselves in that way. And now we've got the gig economy coming on top of that. Um, our approach with, with all of this is that, um, it, I mean, there's kind of two ways to go here. What, what one, is, one is, do you actually try and push people towards um, or push the economy towards the direction of, of only engaging people on a permanent full-time basis? That's hard. I do think what I've been talking about in, in, in terms of trying to pursue modernity as it were to pursue that high-tech manufacturing will be the means by which we have an economy which generates more secure well-paid permanent jobs um, but i think what is really important in the here and now is to make sure that there are minimum that, that we try and uh, proliferate if that's um, excuse me the right way of saying it minimum standards within those forms of employment so that's and that's the path that we're walking down in a policy sense so earlier this year we announced that we would seek to, uh, in government, uh, put in place minimum standards uh, of employment, you know, inc including you know, the minimum wage for people working in those forms of employment in the gig economy um, and working with the likes of Uber, but also the, the, those other platforms uh, to try and make sure that there are minimum standards there. And I, I, I think that is um, the, the way to go. And, um, certainly, again, it's not something that the, the current government are really looking at. But for us, you know, really, this goes to the core of our mission as a political party, and it's uh, it, it's critically important. I think. Absolutely. Um, another question relating to work and job conditions from Jennifer, who says her 32 year old daughter works in a supermarket and it's mentally and physically exhausting. She's a qualified librarian. Are these jobs still going to be available or do people need to retrain? Now, Jennifer, I presume you're asking there are jobs like being a qualified librarian going to, going to be there in the future. Uh, good, good, good question. Um, I, I suppose the honest answer is I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, I really hope they are. Um, libraries feel to me like they are and I'm sure you, you feel this as well, Kate, are kind of really important centres of community gathering. Um, and, uh, and, and so my uh, lecture is based on Geelong and um, uh, our family is, is a member of the network of libraries in Geelong and certainly it, it, it is vibrant. You know, I get that we are moving into a, a world where um, uh, physical books are perhaps not the same as they were in the past. But I think the, the sort of, I reckon the, the, the bigger kind of point that comes from your question is, is that we really do need to be thinking about what the jobs of the future look like and making sure that there is a, uh, well, firstly, really good advice being given to, to kids and indeed adults who are looking to um, move into different places of employment. Um, and then really aligning our entire educational system, particularly VET and TAFE, 
to make sure that that training is available. Um, just about the first announcement that Anthony, that Albo made was the creation of Jobs and Skills Australia, and it would be um, mandated with the task of trying to do that work to make sure that we are really aligning our educational system with what those jobs are so that people, if they do need to train, genuinely have the opportunity to find the training which will get them the job that they want. Excellent. Um, quite a few questions about renewable energy and technology, Richard. So I'll try and um, theme this up a bit so that we can get through as many as possible. But essentially both Barbara and Gary agreeing that um, we should be embracing and in fact leaders in renewable energy technology. Uh, so, and, and both of them note how slow the, the current government's been to move on this technology and are asking um, when is too late for us to move? When are we going to have missed the opportunities to, to get in on this green revolution that's happening? Yeah, so it's a really good question, and it's one I, I've, you know, spoken with Chris Bowen a lot about. Um, and I think the answer to it goes a bit like this: um, the, the resource isn't going anywhere. So I, I think our wind resources and our our solar resources will be exploited. Um, I think the question is whether or not it's going to be um, Australian technologies, Australian companies, which do the exploiting and whether we get to leverage the benefit that comes from it. Um, you know, I mean by that, that, that leverage, not just in terms of our own use of renewables, but in terms of really being the world leader in this technology where we are, if you like, um, helping other countries walk down this path and taking the economic opportunity that, that that represents? Or is it in fact going to be other countries that come here and do it for us? That I think is actually kind of the way um, this is going to play out. And I, and I think the answer to that question then is, I, I don't like, this, this is all happening pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of, I mean, I'm making this up now, but my instinctive feel it's kind of the next five years or so where um, we're either going to be on this train or not. Um, and it's, I, I really cannot kind of express enough how profoundly important it is that we, we, we are doing this. Um, uh, it, 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 it might be the biggest opportunity we will miss if, if, if we don't. Um, and I think it's, certainly I don't think the government, the current government really understand um, the opportunity that presents itself. Um, but other countries are going to see it. Um, and, and people will come here um, and it, we must be able to do better than simply, in a sense, uh, renting the space um, for others to come uh, and be here and, and do the exploiting rather than, than us. Um, but in turn, it, 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 and I suppose the final point to say on this is it's, you know, there is a degree to which we can step back and the private sector will, will act. I think, you know, I, I, I mean, I think there, there is a whole lot of activity in the private sector. So a lot of this is happening beyond the realm of government and that's great. Um, but government is so powerful in terms of being able to really um, turbocharge this, to, to really get ahead of the curve and make this happen. I, I mean, in, in many ways, I'm not really doing much more than kind of articulating um, a, a kind of a modern um, activist in, uh, industry policy. Um, and, and industry policy, activist industry policies have been at the heart of Labor government's past, certainly, um, you know, certainly was during Run Gillard, massively during Hawke Keating, um, it, was, it was very much part of Whitlam. You know, this is actually what we do in government. Um, it's not what the other team do at all. And, and I think that th th this is what industry policy is going to look like for us were we to win the next election. And it's, I think, one of the really major reasons why it's important we do win. Mm, absolutely. And we've just spent a day in the House um, debating legislation to allow for um, offshore wind farms, um, mm. which, you know, again, this government's taken years to get around to and we've got all these projects ready to go, but they just haven't been able to because the government's been missing the opportunity. So, so much more to be done there. Um, moving on to small business now, uh, Richard and Ian would like to know what a federal Labor government would do to help small businesses and notes what a difficult time it's been, the way that, uh, that uh, JobKeeper has been removed and, and the issues that small business are facing. Yeah, well, I'm really glad that this question has been asked. Um, and and I, as people know, I'm the Shadow Minister for Small Business. Um, 
first thing I think, uh, well, a, a small business has been on the front line of, of COVID. Um, not every small business. I mean, there are some sectors that have done well, but there's a lot of sectors which have really, really done it tough. Um, and I think one of the, the uh, something which is at the heart of this is any business really, but, but certainly um, small businesses are based on having a predictable landscape on which you can conceive a business model that you can make work. And one thing that's happened in the last 18 months is predict predictability has literally been obliterated. Uh, you know, when, when you, we don't know whether we're in lockdown or not in, in any given week or month, um, there's a lot of businesses that one can easily imagine, events, businesses, hospitality, anything which is exposed to um, the international border, travel agents, um, you know, just completely devastating. Um, and, and so it, 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 businesses have done it tough. Last year, I think, to the government's credit, the JobKeeper, we, you know, we would make some criticisms about exactly how it was um, put in place. But fundamentally, JobKeeper was a really important measure to um, get us through the pandemic last year. But you know, I think one of the real failures for the nation was that in March of this year, when JobKeeper came to an end and we got that it was never going to be something that could be permanent. But at that moment, people understood, the government understood, it was, it was in the budget that they were framing, that there would be lockdowns during the course of this year. And yet there was nothing put in place um, to, to, if you like, replace JobKeeper in the event that there were lockdowns in various parts of the country. And so what we've then seen evolve over the course of this year is a kind of iterative piecemeal uh, solution, which has worked in some cases, but there have definitely been holes in others. Um, and again, that now feels like for a whole lot of businesses, it's coming to an end too soon. Um, and you know, so, so lots of businesses are really facing um, an existential question. And even for those that get through, they will be getting through with, you know, a significant amount of debt. Um, we, I, I think that we, we, we will have a fair bit to say about this in, in the lead up to the election. So in part, people won't need to sort of wait for those announcements. But I guess the thing I would want to say now is this, we really want to have uh, we Labor want to have a very different conversation with small business than we've ever had before. Um, I think one of the lessons that came out of the last election and certainly was contained in the election review was that we had found ourselves talking to, you know, perhaps a too narrow a slice of the country and that when we lift our eyes and think about others that we need to be talking to, uh, to me, you know, an obvious place that we should be starting is, is small business. Um, a lot of the interests that small business challenges that small business have, I think are very coincident with the kind of issues that we have pursued as, as a party of working people over the uh, over, over our history. And indeed, if you look at other social democratic parties in the world, like the Democrats in the US, they very naturally represent the, the interests of small business. I think we need to be making sure that um, in doing that, um, we're obviously listening to small business and the challenges they face. I think we need to uh, be thinking about ways in which we can ease the administrative burden of small business so that people can focus on that kind of spark or interest which, 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 which made them kind of pursue the leap of faith of starting up their own business. I mean, one, uh, something that um, a cake maker has said to me was that, you know, they really wanted to make cakes. That was their passion. Um, they, it was a big moment when they opened their first door to start selling cakes. And on that day, they suddenly became, they discovered they needed to be a lawyer, an accountant, a human resource manager, and <laughs> a million other things. Yeah. Um, and they were doing that rather than making cakes. Um, well, I think we've got to help people get back to the, the thing which, which sort of sparked their enthusiasm at, at the start. And I think there's a whole lot of area. When you start down that thought path, if you like, there's a whole lot of things I think we can do. And, and, and I think the other thing that then becomes clear is the degree to which um, the, the Liberals really have taken small business for granted. Um, they haven't actually done that much to just help in the nuts and bolts of what small business faces. So we, we, we really are very keen on um, trying to talk more about this during the election, a, a new deal for small business. We, we will look at a lot of kind of granular um, uh, measures which we think will make a difference for small business, noting that they really have been on the front line of COVID and that now is a, is a moment where they need our help and to also acknowledge in that process that 
um, collectively, they're the biggest employer in, in the country. You know, collectively, really, they are the engine room of our economy. Um, so it, it, it's a critically important area that we focus on and we mean to. Absolutely. It's um, such a big part of um, Jagger Jagger and our community that all of our small businesses and it has been, you know, such a difficult time for them. Um, moving back to the, the research space, Richard, Karen says, I'm a molecular biologist with a PhD, an inventor turned biotech startup business development and projects manager based in Melbourne. And Karen says she may be biased, but she totally agrees that supporting commercialization of research from renewable energy to antivirals is so important for Australia's future. However, living from grant to grant is difficult and it doesn't build the body of work needed to establish a research profile. How will Labor tackle the job instability faced by research scientists that often sees talented scientists leaving research or leaving Australia? Uh, researchers change jobs so often, there are periods of unemployment and there's no possibility yeah. of long service leave. Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I don't have all the answers, but, but, but very much aware um, of, of the dilemma. And, and um, I think in terms of, um, uh, how to say, science is not a wholly public endeavor, uh, but it is very significantly a public endeavor. Um, uh, Newton, Einstein all did their work on the public purse. Um, it's it's um, our, our universities, uh, institutions like the CSIRO, um, making sure that that, that is um, as, as robust as possible is is profound. It, well, it is the key to whether or not we are going to be generating the kind of um, research that we need to to make sure that we keep doing science at the level that we. That, that we should as a, as a nation of our size. Um, and again, you know, that, that those areas have really been decimated over the last eight years by um, funding cuts from this government, which, you know, really um, doesn't have a sense of the importance of science at all. So I think, I, you know, I think the fundamental answer to your question ultimately um, is around um, the, the, the raw commitment to science in terms of funding. But I think there are some specific issues which your question goes to about making sure that, um, you know, particularly kind of, um, I would say sort of mid-term mid scientists, um, that there is um, career longevity, that there, there is career progression that is, is, is um, developed in respect of that. And, and it is a... Um, uh, it's a narrative that's well understood, but it's a problem that I think hasn't been properly solved yet. Is probably the way I would I would I would describe it. Um, I do want to say though one thing that that which which kind of goes a bit beyond the the, the question, but I think it does underpin the the political ability to fund science. I, I you know I really I'm a science graduate. I I um, I feel very passionately about the need for science to play a much, a much bigger part in um, in our political discourse. I've you know, co-convened the Parliamentary Friends of Science for literally the last seven or eight years, which uh, I've been very proud to do. At, at one level, though, it's been very hard to get interest in um, amongst colleagues in, in science. I, I think ultimately... No, not with this government. Surely not. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, th I think... I think raising the science literacy of the parliament is, is a challenge. I think we need to, I, I, I actually think we need to, as a nation, change our cultural relationship to science. I, I don't think as a country we, we value science in anything like the way that, that we, we should. Um, you know, one of the points I often make is uh, right now, uh, perhaps the, the, the biggest science project in the world today is the Square Kilometre Array Telescope. Um, it's, its aspiration is to build a radio telescope through an array of smaller dishes, which when sort of used through interferometry to kind of uh, turn them into one big telescope gives you a, uh, a coverage of a square kilometre. It won't, it will be a while before that's achieved, I might say, but, but that's the sort of, that's, that's the aim. Um, it will become operational in the latter part of this decade. It is going to, uh, well, it will illuminate the universe in a way that is almost unimaginable. I mean, to try and put that in context, the universe is about 13 and a half billion years old. Um, when you look at a distance, you are seeing light that was emitted a period of time ago, which means in a sense, you look back in history. 
Um, we can right now with our equipment see about halfway back through the lifetime of the universe. Um, this telescope will allow us to see back to 13.4 of the 13.5 billion years of the universe's history. Um, it will be genuinely amazing. Um, it is, it's a multinational um, science project. Um, it, it, and, and it is why it's being described. And you know, it's, it's right there, it, 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 like it's, it's about to happen. Um, this is happening in Australia. The Square Kilometre Array Telescope is based in Australia, uh, in a place called in, near Murchison um, in Western Australia. Um, it's, it's based in, as well in the Karoo in South Africa, and it's headquartered in Manchester. Um, but the, the physical locations of the array are in WA and, um, and South Africa. So it's happening right here. It will generate the biggest computer in the world, which will be in Perth. Um, and who knows any of that? Like that's not in our newspapers. Um, we're not talking to our kids about it. It's never discussed in parliament. Um, like this is, uh, it's completely unbelievable what's happening here. Um, and yet by and large in the public discourse, no one cares. And I just think, geez, it, like the proportion of kids pursuing science has consistently dropped um, since you know, year 10, which is the first chance you get to not do science. It's been consistently going down since 1982. So the number of, the proportion of our kids wanting to study science has dropped. We can have the biggest science project in the world today in our backyard and no one even knows about it. What do you think are the chances given those two facts that we will change our reality in terms of commercialising science in this country? And so to me, I think, or to address the question, making sure that we properly fund um, mid-term scientists in terms of the research that they do. I, I, I just think um, we need to have a completely different conversation about science in this country. And when I speak to people from the US or from Britain, science genuinely does have a much bigger part in, play a bigger part in their national discourse than it does in ours. Um, uh, and going back to that, you know, what I sort of opened with in terms of trying to climb the technological ladder, turning science into jobs, I actually think at its heart is, is this question. You know, we must as a nation change our cultural relationship to science and it requires a really different conversation. Mm. Richard, there is a lot of appreciation um, both in the chat and in the Q&A for um, what you're talking about and, and um, for the vision you're putting forward. Um, theming up some of the comments and questions around that goes to, I suppose, the um, how you take that vision um, out there and sell it in an election. So I'll read um, Bernie's question as the theme here, which is, what you said tonight about playing to our strengths makes good sense. However, there's an issue about leadership. Many of us are incredibly despondent because of the lack of political leadership. This is, of course, much to do with the coalition government. However, there's a feeling Labor is too quiet and perhaps too timid. We're desperately in need of quality and visionary leadership. How do you respond to this? Yeah, so I, um, uh, I, I very much hear the question. I thank, thank, um, thank the questioner for it. Um, uh, it, it, and we definitely need it. So it, it's, it's um, I know the question is directed at Labor and, and I'll answer it. Let me just start by sort of, uh, I, I, I feel so frustrated with um, this government's uh, failure of, of leadership in the last, um, you know, during the pandemic and, you know, and, and probably the area of policy that I've, I've, thought most about in my time in Parliament is sort of in the national security strategic policy space. And we haven't talked about that tonight, but um, you know, we really are living in very complicated um, strategic circumstances. This government has got no idea about any of that. Yeah, there's there's no, no thought going into any of that. Um, when the pandemic hit, um, you know, we've really consistently seen a government that has reacted to events rather than led them. Uh, I mean, it's deeply frustrating. We've really watched, I think, the country fracture. Um, never before, I think never before, in a national crisis have we seen the federal tier of government write its role so small. Um, in fact, when you think about national crises since Federation, they tended to be characterised by the national government of the time taking the lead. Um, this is, I mean, Scott Morrison really is the first Prime Minister since Federation to write his job smaller than the last Prime Minister. Um, and, and it makes no sense. Um, and so I, I, I can't remember a time where um, I think as you go around the country, we feel less like a coherent nation and more like a sort of a, a collection of 
um, jurisdictions at a state level. Um, and yet, you know, in a, in a globalised world um, where we really have kind of conquered in many ways the tyranny of distance which defined Australia, you know, when Manning Clark used that term, when, you know, Perth is not two weeks away, it's, it's a three-hour flight away or four-hour flight away. Um, it's completely crazy, the idea that we would be approaching the world um, as a set of disparate jurisdictions rather than one country and, and missing out on the opportunities in that. There's been a, and, and you know, you can get like the, the failure to roll out vaccination on time was really a, a failure of leadership this time last year and understanding that actually vaccines are obviously going to be the way they have, you know, the, 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 the history of pandemics um, is um, a little bit about how you initially respond to the virus and, and the degree to which one hides from it. But ultimately, um, every pandemic has come to an end. Or, or resolution is perhaps a better way of putting it by virtue of a society learning to live with it. Um, and, in, and in a modern world, that was always going to be about vaccines. So how anyone could have been sitting on their hands this time last year and not getting on the front foot about that is just one of the great failures of public administration in this country. So you're right, there has been no leadership. Um, but I get the questions about us. Um, I, 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 what, it has been hard, it, it's been a hard time to be in opposition. Um, I can't remember a time where there has been less airtime for oppositions, um, and understandably so. I mean, you think about uh, the, the way in which we've been kind of hanging on to every word of Daniel Andrews, understandably, as he's been outlining decisions that his government's been making, which absolutely affect all of our lives, and, and the same to a lesser degree with the federal government because they've just not been there. But what the point I'm really making is that government as the source of authority decision-making, which determines how we live our lives, has been um, really the only thing that people can listen to and consume. And the, the ability to sort of um, participate or engage in or entertain a, a public debate or a political argument has really you know, that, that the space for that has been less in the last, um, well, since the pandemic started than at any point I can remember since I've been in politics. And so, um, it, 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 well, I guess what I'm saying is it, it, it has been therefore difficult for us to get a message out. Um, but the thing I want to reassure you about is this, the work is being done. The things I'm talking about tonight is, is the kind of um, messages that we want to talk about during an election campaign. And, and, and when the election comes, we will be given the space to articulate our vision. I, I've got no doubt about that. Um, so I don't, whilst I think, you know, that there hasn't been a lot of opportunity to talk about this stuff up until now, um, we will be given the opportunity that the, the, people, the, the, the media and everyone is going to want to look at what the alternatives are. Um, and I frankly think Australians are crying out for an alternative and we are doing the work to present it. Um, and, and central to that work, I think, is a notion of leadership, that, that what the country's been missing um, in the last few years is that. Um, and that in a way, what we have to offer is vision, I think, and, and, and hopefully you know, I'm giving you something of a flavour of that, but is the leadership to enact that vision. And um, Anthony Albanese will certainly be articulating that. Um, you know, is very passionate about it. Um, and, and I think you will see that play out in the way you would want it to during the election. Uh, thank you, Richard. So we do still have quite a few questions. I will try and get through as many of You're your right. questions um, as we can, because they're all very interesting. Uh, and taking us to a slightly different sector now, um, question from Joanne, who runs one of our wonderful um, local organisations, Boots for All. And, um, Joanne would like to know more about um, Labor's plans for the circular economy and social enterprise sector uh, and how Labor would look to dissolve barriers to employment for young people who currently are facing barriers and those who are long-term um, unemployed or underemployed. Was the first part of that the circular economy? That's right, We're yes. talking about recycling? Might be slightly outside of your um, uh, areas of expertise. Um, I oh, well, 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 just sort of very quickly, if, if we are sort of talking yes. about, uh, I, I think about the circular economy in terms of recycling. So if that's if that is, um, I won't, won't spend long on it. But but um, I, I it, it's um, we. Funnily enough, I had a briefing this morning from Quenos, who are in Melbourne Southwest uh, in Altona. Um, they're really, I mean, they they make plastics essentially, but um, the infrastructure that they have in place is really 
um, about the only infrastructure in the country which which really could genuinely get um, a, a, a sort of a, a plastics recycling industry going. And and the good news here is that the the users of plastics, sort of those who Kellogg's and the like, who who uh, put out retail brands in our supermarkets, all have kind of uh, mandated pretty ambitious targets around the reuse and recycling of plastics, which is a, a very good thing. Um, there, so, so, so a circular economy is going to happen. The question is whether it's going to happen here, or, or whether or not it, you know whether we can do the recycling here, or whether we're going to be relying on that technology effectively happening overseas. Um, I, I think again, this kind of goes back to. Um, the, the question of the reconstruction fund, making sure that we're climbing the technological ladder, making sure that we are um, uh, we're engaged in high tech manufacturing. That will be high tech manufacturing, um, recycling plastics, um, and and developing that circular economy is 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 really important. It's obviously um, you know it's obviously a great thing from the environment. It, it is it is part of the process of of having a more uh, a sort of a cleaner economy, if I can put it that way. Um, but but the point really is that it's high tech. You know, it's a technological challenge, and it's one that we can definitely do in Australia. Um, but it's not inevitable, and and kind of government does need to play a part in in making this happen. And I I, I think there's a very exciting opportunity for us. Um, probably the how do we break down barriers for young people getting into employment and the long term unemployed? Maybe if I just spend a bit of time on that. Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think, um, look, I'd be honest in saying that that I've kind of come to this area of policy pretty late. Um, I've, I've become responsible for this uh, earlier this year and probably to my shame had not done as much thinking about this as, as probably you have, Kate, and others in, in the caucus had. Um, when, in, in looking at it though, um, it, it, it it does feel to me like there is, um, like it's an area which is, uh, just strikes me as dramatically in need of reform in this sense. Um, what, what people will say about our kind of, um, our employment sector, that, that is to say the services that we provide those who are unemployed to get back into work, is that by global standards, we are pretty good in respect of those who are, let's say, short-term unemployed. So in other words, getting people who have been unemployed for I don't know, up to six months back into work, we're, we're pretty good at that. Um, but the stat that has been consistently getting worse throughout this government is the growth in the long-term unemployed. And when you think about it, that is the people who, who we're, uh, well, what, what that means is that we are increasingly leaving a larger number of people behind. Uh, that's, that's what that stat means. And you can, and, and once you sort of hit the 12 month mark, it doesn't really matter where you cut that stat. Like you can look at the growth of those who've been unemployed for a year, two years, five years, 10 years. It's all been going in the wrong direction and consistently going in the wrong direction um, really for, for the last eight years. So the first thing is it seems to me that we need to be reframing this conversation in that sense. Um, yes, the unemployment number as a totality matters. Um, it is long-term disengagement with the workforce, which is really the problem that we need to focus on and we need to try and solve. Okay, point one. Point two is that when, I, when you look at, um, we, we literally speak to everybody um, who's engaged in this sector. Um, so, you know, um, not-for-profits, think tanks like the capita, but also the job service agencies themselves, uh, you get back a consistent message that what we've got is uh, uh, a system of mutual obligation. Now, we support mutual obligation, but the point is the mutual obligation that we are asking people to perform needs to be meaningful in the sense of, of, of genuinely kind of improving people's prospects of getting back into work. Um, if, in fact, all it does is kind of devolve into, you know, a, a process where there's a lot of hoops that people are being asked to jump through almost for the sake of it. And then in turn, what happens is the job services agencies ultimately kind of end up really being the compliance police as opposed to those who are responsible for, or, or, or rather than getting people work. Um, well, then it seems to me that, you know, we, the, the system kind of isn't working. And, and, and what the stats would indicate is that, you know, that key stat is heading in the wrong direction. So I think in all of that, um, you know, without, again, having all the answers, and I'm not sure, uh, I mean, what, what's clear to me is this is an area we need to be working on. 
um, it, it's, it's probably one which, which we would um, better tackle in government with the resources of government to sort of understand all this. But I think in the space that I've just described is really the opportunity, I think, for, for significant reform. But what I ultimately know is this, um, as, as a Labor Party, it's not good enough that we uh, would, as a government, preside over a set of circumstances which saw a growing number of Australians being left behind, and it's simply not what we're going to do. Um, you know, this would be a critically important um, uh, challenge and task for us, is to make sure that in uh, thinking about how we reconstruct the country, how we build a modern economy, that we're doing that for everyone, and we're building an economy which, which does bring people along. Okay, thank you for that, Richard. Okay, I'm going to give one last question. I think we have covered off most of the themes of the questions, if not the specifics. Uh, if we haven't got your question tonight, please um, do contact me and my office and we will come back to you um, separately to this. I do want to keep the conversation going because both the questions and what's happening in the chat box tonight are excellent. It's clear that this is something that people are really engaged with. They know that we need such a different policy setting uh, and vision for all of these spaces. So um, let's keep the conversation going. But last question of the night comes from Anders uh, and it's going back to manufacturing and asking, uh, I wonder if a federal Labor government will see the return of car manufacturing in Australia, with Toyota still developing hybrid hydrogen vehicles in Altona and Ford Asia Pacific also still in Victoria, is there some sort of policy to see either manufacturer resume local assembly? So, uh, great question, and, 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 and in a way that I'd right answer that question is, I wonder that too, meaning I don't think we should write this off. Um, I, I think that, um, if you think about our strengths, uh, let, let's broaden it a little bit and say, I, I think transportation has been central to the Australian story, um, really, uh, since European settlement. I mean, and, and it is it is Manning Park, you know, it, it is um, Australia being kind of defined by the tyranny of distance. And it's meant that um, we, we have been uh, in, in aviation, in rail, in shipping, but also very much in terms of road transport. Um, getting, being at the cutting edge of that has actually been really important for us. Um, you know, a national airline matters. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's one of the most recognisable brands in Australian brands in the world. Um, it's in the space of transport. So I actually think transport is an area which is a which should be a natural strength of the country. Um, and I think there are, you know, kind of a, where, where transport goes in, in the future, I think is gonna be very exciting. I think, for example, really local urban-based aviation um, is going to, is, is, is just sort of creeping onto the radar now, but I think in the next 50, I reckon over the next sort of 10, 15 years, we're gonna see a revolution there. I think we're, we are as well placed to be a part of that as any place in the world. But certainly when you think about cars and electric vehicles, um, yeah, I mean, I mean there, there, there is an opportunity. Um, and, and so I, 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 I suppose, I mean, I think we've, so I think transport is a national strength. I think we need to be open to the idea of this. Ed Husick, who, who is our shadow minister for industry, floated exactly this, um, that we should be seeing whether we can get back into car or car manufacturing in the context of electric vehicles. Um, I, I, you know, I, th I think um, once you walk down the idea of we really want to be a high tech manufacturer, it's hard to uh, kind of ignore this or the opportunity that this, this represents. And um, I, I think it, it, you know, be really exciting and, and coming from, you know, a car seat was a car seat in the sense of Geelong, like, John was Ford Town. I drive past the old Ford factory all the time. There's a sense of um, nostalgia and sadness associated with the fact that we don't make cars in Geelong uh, anymore. I would love to see us uh, as a nation uh, be back in the, the manufacturing of, of, of cars. I think it'd be fantastic. Okay, well, Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Like I said, that was actually such an engaged and um, really enlivening discussion to have about actually what the future of our country should look like in so many directions. So I'm really pleased that you could all join us tonight. Um, thanks for 
hopping on another Zoom and not going out to dinner, even though you can. Um, like I said, please um, feel free to follow up um, with me and my office with anything that you feel you still want to say or um, ask a question about. And Richard, again, sincerely, that was just really fantastic to have um, that time from you and to have um, your input into clearly what's an area that you've thought a lot about and that you're really passionate about. So very much appreciate it. Thanks, Kate, and, and thanks for all that you're doing in the Parliament and, and in your electorate as well. It's really great to have you as a part of the team. Excellent. Okay, good night, everyone. Stay safe.